On behalf of the captain and the crew, we'd like to welcome you on board Experience 64, now departing to the world of summer 2022 travel reviews. <phone rings> Cabin crew, arm doors, and cross check. Thank you for listening to us today. If this is the first time listening to this podcast, welcome aboard. If you're a returning listener, we're glad you're back. Seat 1A provides tips and tricks from more than 5 million miles worth of flying to help you take off from the crowd. In today's experience, recorded on the 7th of August, 2022, we're going to discuss the recent travels that we went on in the current travel chaos that is around us today and then we'll uh, wrap up with a discussion of some events in the world of aviation okay right on well the last time we uh pulled out a recording we were together in the queen's terminal <laughs> terminal two at heathrow yeah yeah <laughs> and you uh you had just come off a flight from vancouver i had just flown in from copenhagen yeah and you know we we, we did the recording and you know those of us that those of you that listen you would just probably heard it in retrospect, it was very anticlimactic. I think we were both going into that terminal, you know, you in the morning and uh, me just coming out of it thinking, my God, it's going to be so bad. It's going right. to be so bad. But the headlines that day were a little bit climatic, saying that they're reducing flights to 100,000 people. But, I mean, nevertheless, it was less climatic than I thought. Yeah, it, it was a breeze. I mean, and then I did E-Gates. I mean, you did regular just because you have a young child. But it was like mm-hmm. E-Gates, I was through in... 10 minutes yeah same we i didn't even need the even if we could have used the gate, i didn't need the gate because we got to that border agent so fast i hadn't even had the chance to pull out the passports from the bag yeah it was hilarious and then the bags were there you were there everything was there it was yeah. like this is something's not right can we just add a bit of chaos <laughs> me it was like yeah waited a bit for the bag but i'm like all right if i just wander down to the uh mobile shop and pick up a a, a sim card and once that it was all done i went back and my bag was uh making the trip around the uh the belt so yeah interesting just kind of as we lead into our summer of uh travel when you and i said goodbye you were putting me into a uh london black cab uh, me and my family were off to our destination um, and I don't know if you remember, but the the cabbie was not perturbed, but he was a bit like fuddy duddy about the destination I was giving. I don't know if you remember that, right? Yeah, because you were going to, um, well, Hammersmith, Hammersmith, yeah. So, but I mean that that could be like, well, do you mean the station? Do you mean the district? Yeah. So here, I, I dissected it on the drive because I wanted to like just, you know, I didn't want this guy to hate us or anything. So when we approached that taxi queue, there's like a I don't know, airport staff or whoever, a taxi person, you know, filtering. And the guy asked me where, and I just generally said Hammersmith because where we were staying was in the general area of Hammersmith. I didn't give an exact. And so when the cab driver asked, or the taxi driver said, what did you tell him? I said, Hammersmith. And he was like, all in a puff. So when I asked him why, he's like, well, the minute you say Hammersmith, that only gives me one hour to get back to Heathrow to continue picking up. If I don't make it back to Heathrow within the hour, I'm done with Heathrow for the day. Oh, I wow. Back there. I was like, okay. oh, I didn't. Well, of course I didn't know. He's like, well, no, you wouldn't know that as a tourist. I'm like, yeah, of course. I was like, well, what ideally would I, should I say? And he said something like the Chiswick Business Park. He said, that gives me an hour and a half to get back, which is realistic because the one hour is unrealistic. No you know, kidding. Based on whoever makes these plans to get there to where we were going and back at the end of it. I was like, aha. So who tell like the person you tell at the beginning is the one who, uh, yeah, I guess they probably tab- they're matching the tallies their, or matches. Yeah. Up yeah. Or something. Exactly. Exactly. There's, or maybe there's like an ANPR that's, you know, cross-referencing that plate to where the taxi went. And when hmm. the taxi shows up again, it matches the time or I, I don't know. I guess well, it's I mean, out of fairness. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, all crazy sort of things to learn along the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah. tidbit, because am I ever going to take a taxi out of Heathrow? Maybe not. 
No, I mean, well, yeah, I took the Elizabeth line. Uh, I mean, it's which only is been wonderful. Over a month. By the it way. is absolutely ter- terrific, air conditioned. Yeah, um, and beats uh, sitting in a Piccadilly tube. <laughs> No kidding. We 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 got on the um, Elizabeth Line at one point in the trip uh, out of Paddington Station. It honestly felt, and the people I was with, um, my wife said, "This feels like we're in an Asian hotel, five star hotel lobby." True. Yeah. Like with the big angles and the high ceilings and the light, and they may as well have been like water rushing down the side of the wall to give an effect. Was that the you're station going. you're talking about, or the state? Just the station. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not even the train. Yeah, it was crazy. And then the whole. They have the system, like in many of the Asian countries, we have the two-door system mm-hmm. where the train is glassed off. Right, yeah. So so it opens up and then it opens up, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the train itself is fantastic. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if we if we go back a little bit before we met in London, I mean, I had uh, a few days in Copenhagen, had something that I think we need to talk about in a future experience where my flight was delayed and i received emails about it leaving toronto so i'm like all right i'm late packing or delayed packing so i'll just keep going and it was a question of well how soon like do i show up at the terminal do i show up when the uh you know the expected flight is supposed to go does the gate close even know they know that it's not going to go for a few more hours like and and the other fun was it's like uh all right the the uh, the self-check baggage was broken so you had to put all of your bags on the floor in front of a specific counter um, oh my. on that particular day and they're like Copenhagen I'm like oh they're like well that's already all gone but uh okay we'll move it to the front of the queue and <laughs> they put it on the belt and away it went oh no that's risky yeah, yeah. but I saw it go down the belt so I'm like okay I'm trusting that it's that's uh, the main thing as long yeah. as it goes on the belt yeah then that's all you can do but yes, no good point. And let's uh, we're gonna do it. Let's do an episode just on exactly what you said. Is when do you show up when there's an official posted delay, and how does that work with timings and the effect? Because there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot we can explore in that one um, to share with our listeners. So yeah. And then I, I got in, and it's like you know the the flight got pushed back and pushed back, and it was until midnight. And the lounge because I didn't um, have the air the Maple Leaf Lounge for that section of the flight. I was on a third party Dragon Pass app. And the, I guess it would have been the Plaza uh, Premium, Plaza Premium Lounge in Pearson, and it was jam ram packed full. Um, and it was nine thirty, and it closed at ten p.m. And they were like, "Well, you know, uh, well we're closing." And I'm like, "Well, no, it's still nine thirty. And then you know, I leave, and then I look, and I'm like, "No, they're they're closing at 10. So I go back in. They're like, "Well, we're 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 closing." And I'm like, "There's other people behind me." And and they just weren't being responsive. So I went in and sat down. You just left the counter and just went in? Yeah. And then she's like, <laughs> wait a sec, you need to check in. I'm like, well, I was trying to do that for the last five minutes. Bravo. Bravo. That's funny. You know, it's funny. These lounges, I think we talked about lounges. People think I must go to the lounge to get my free whatever and yeah. I'm going to relax. But sometimes it's just nicer to just, I mean, apart from the food thing, just find a quiet gate yeah. and sit with and I mean, around you. It, for my entire trip, I mean, the two like non-airline lounges, they had food. They were all right, but they were jam packed. And I'm like, I don't know. Was it worth, you know, the the you know the 25 or 39 US that I spent for the lounge? And and I'm like, probably not. I could have probably not found a decent spot, sat out, watched the. Uh, you could have spent you know that amount of money yeah. and eaten yourself exactly to the and heart's content and, out in the yeah. By the window and watching the plane uh, get pushed around. So that's right. <laughs> so okay. So let's start. So you flew Toronto Copenhagen on yep. Air Canada. On Air Canada, yeah, it was uh, premium economy, nice seats. Um, on, the, uh, on a Dreamliner. On a Dreamliner, yeah. Yep. And uh, bulkhead, and it, it was it was comfortable. And I mean, the seats they went back, but was one. I don't know if it was timing because it was so late, and we actually didn't get food service till one in the morning. But uh, or just me being excited, not able to sleep much at all. Um, and then we get to Copenhagen, pretty straightforward. You know, very run, runs very well. Passport control, everything was straightforward. And then right by the check-in, there's a whole pile of machines uh, to to buy train tickets or passes or whatever. So I bought like a 48-hour pass for 
Copenhagen and the train station is right there or mm-hmm. a metro station is right there, which is yeah, really it's, it's very built. well laid out there actually. And yeah, like in the city center within 20 minutes and my hotel was about a five minute walk from the central station. So brilliant. That's excellent. Yeah. I know. I remember going to Copenhagen and having pretty much the same experience, like just seamless. Yeah. Danish. Yeah. Nice. Scandinavian. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. then going back, I mean, or, or leaving um, straightforward as well. Uh, you know, clear customs because I was going to the UK and then having everybody essentially pre uh, scan their boarding passes before you could go into the hold room. Yep. And then when it's like, okay, the plane's ready to leave, everybody is already on. loaded. Everyone's done. They just get it's in the plane. Great. Yeah. Now, which airline was that? Uh, that was SAS, but not SAS, Denmark or Norway, or the ones who are having strike issues because it was flying to the UK. It's SAS Ireland, I think is what it's listed as. Mm-hmm. Tax purposes and whatever for flights to the UK, that's the subsidiary that, that works. And straightforward, you know, very Scandinavian. What I think it was a 320. Okay. They're they're long gone of the old MD-80s. I remember exactly. Yeah. The last ones just powering those things through. Exactly. Yeah. So that was uh that was that. Uh very Scandinavian, very easy. Like we said, you know, check-in or sorry, uh, customs in Heathrow was super simple. You know, forgot how long of a walk it was between Terminal 2 and the uh you know train stations from there, multiple things underground, but uh yeah, that worked all right. Uh, my hotel was right by King's Cross. Pancras dropped off my bags, went right back out and met you at the airport. So That's right. <laughs> so while you were doing that, we were flying on very simple Air Canada, Vancouver to Heathrow, 777-300. And it was great. Of course, you know, by just by sheer star on alignment, um, one of the pilots was a friend of mine. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was, it was actually his line check flight. So that was, that was really nice. We got to go visit the flight deck, not during flight, but pre and post, yeah. uh, which was really nice. Flight wasn't crazy packed, but it was probably 85% full. Okay. But nonetheless, we were able to have a row uh, so that you know our son could have some space. Eight hours and 22 minutes. It was fast. Uh, I'm always unique from a purely pilot geek standpoint. This was a non-ETOPS flight. Okay. Um, which means we had to kind of, it was generally say we had to stay close to land. And in this case, it was uh, within 60 minutes. But if you look at the flight path, we were within 60, which was surprising. I mean, obviously that. Any particular reason why it wasn't detops? You know, I got to find out. I got to follow up with my friend and ask him what he found out because I found this out prior. But yeah, it was fine. And it was one of those flights that the landing, and it was the captain landing, of course, <laughs> was so smooth. They greased it in. You didn't even know. You could almost not tell. I mean, me being like, so like aware and with all the experience, I was waiting for it, but we were in a uh, middle bank, you know, three, four, three, we were in the four bank. The window passengers, one had it closed and the other one, it was, you know, just couldn't see through the people. So I didn't really have a proper perspective to see outside to kind of like count it down. And the only reason I knew is I felt the a light bump, yeah. a tiny one. And I just saw the front end of the plane pitching down. I'm like, oh, I guess we've landed. Wow. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was great. We taxi to the gate. And then, of course, the classic announcement, there's an aircraft occupying the gate. We need to wait for it to depart. I go, like, oh, here we go. Yeah. But it wasn't bad. Well, either... What, what threw me for a loop is I, I know the layout of Heathrow quite well. I could tell which run we were on. I knew kind of generally where we were going. And when they made the announcement, we were sort of in a hold spot. And then, so we held and sat there for, I don't know, five to eight minutes. And then we went to kind of like on a bit of a loopy tour, driving around all over the place. I was like, well, that's strange. So either they reassigned us to a different gate, which is entirely possible just to speed things up. Or I was, I'm completely off my mark and we were like, I don't know, sitting out in a field somewhere. (laughs) So Anyway, it was, it was like not even 20 minutes. Oh, Um, welcome to terminal five. That's right. Exactly. Uh, And then we were in. So 
Yeah, no issues there. So nice. So then we we basically stayed in London uh, the whole time, but you continued on. Yeah, I took uh, Eurostar from uh, Saint Pancras, Pancras, to... Pancras to um, to Brussels, um, Midi, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, queuing up for security and customs. A little bit chaotic, but not bad. Oh, just I was to gonna say because right, we went to Saint Pancras not on the train, but just buy something, and it looked a bit intense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it wasn't bad. I mean, I've had worse, and uh, I had a bit of angst because when I checked out of um, Copenhagen, I had accident. I had two uh, mobile phones with me, one with um, you know unlocked for SIMs around the world, and one Canadian one, and I'd forgotten them both in the tray. Both in the in, train? In, in, no tray in the in the security oh. tray at, at Copenhagen. So I had to like go back and the woman's like you know you know know, unlock them can prove they're yours i'm like okay here you go and oh my okay yeah another thing in copenhagen is you can't walk through or or they don't like you walking through the security um checkpoint with your passport in your hand they want you to put it in the uh, in the tray i got a little bit of guff from the security person Hmm, interesting yeah but yeah so uh to brussels meeting uh straightforward yeah, I hadn't been on Eurostar before, but I uh, ended up on time. Uh, the one connections um, hallway at Brussels Media was closed for construction, so I had to go down to the front, uh, the head of the train, and then across and back out to my ice train to uh, Cologne. And uh, the seat reservation that I thought I had purchased somehow was not there, and I ended up sitting in the vestibule of the train by the door. I remember standing. you sent me this message it's like, "What on earth?" <laughs> and the train was just jam packed. So, so the train must have been like so full. Did you it jump was... on like mid journey of the train? Pardon me? No, it was like, a start. That was a start station. So when you got on that train, it was already that full. It was already that full because we, uh, because I didn't, I had to take like an extra eight to ten minutes because of the closure of this one connection hallway. That yeah, I mean it was it was so full. So how many minutes did you, at the point when you stepped on that train, how many yeah. minutes before scheduled departure was? Probably about five. Oh, okay. So you're I mean, getting it was close it was a, it was twenty minutes at best. I think we were a bit late arriving, but um, yeah, it all worked. I'm just shocked about the. I mean, you have to sit on the floor in the vestibule of a German ice train. No, nah, well, I mean, I the the only other train that I've been in ice train that's busier was one time I took a a train back from. Uh, Munich to Mannheim, the last weekend of Oktoberfest. Well, that's understandable. <laughs> that was the busiest one that I've ever been in, sitting inside the train. This one, I yeah. think, was the second busiest I've ever had. But, uh, but yeah, it was just crazy. And then... Um, oh, wait, hang on. But the, the person that was sitting in your supposedly reserved seat, is it not worth trying to... No, but I mean, there wasn't anything on the seat saying that it was reserved. But did you have a proof? I probably, yeah, I did, but I was just like, nah. And and there were so many people in there anyway, like I couldn't put my bags anywhere. Yeah, yeah, to, to have the argument. Yeah, it was like they already had their stuff up and, and there were like people standing in the aisles and stuff as well. And like, oh yeah, God. to hell with it. <laughs> this just sounds insane. Yeah, what well, I mean, do it your well, It just I mean, doesn't match the country and train that you're on. Uh, there, there are stories of the German train system. Hopefully it gets better because they... Uh, you know, they joined the Star Alliance um, as an alternative. So hopefully they pick up their act, but then caught a regional train to uh, to Dusseldorf from Cologne Central. And it was OK, but really full as well, because the Germans have the summer anyway. For one month, you pay nine euros and you get all the local trains. Oh, wow. So they were busy for German locals. Yeah, for German lo- well, for for anybody. I mean, oh, OK. So I had I had that extra ticket purchased just as a backup. Yeah. So and I used it. I went to um, went out to Wuppertal, Germany, and saw the hanging uh, monorail. Nice. Um, as well, and rode it all the way from one end to the other, and back to the middle in in uh, Wuppertal station. Then the crazy part trying to get out of Dusseldorf. The uh, stop I was at was the first sort of regional stop south of Dusseldorf main station. And the train, I was looking on my train planner, it was delayed for 
the one that was an hour before. So I'm like, well, I'll take that one because I have no idea what's going to happen for the next one. Mm-hmm. And so um, eventually get to Cologne, Deutz. So it's across the, uh, it's right by the, the fairgrounds and it's right across the bridge from main station and sitting there ready to catch my train to Frankfurt. And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, there's a, there's a fire on the line and this train is canceled. <laughs> You, I remember you sent me that screenshot, and I, I don't know I was I was in the middle of the city. And I looked at it twice. I'm like, does it actually say it's fire? Yeah, <laughs> and it has like a little emoji yeah, little of a fire. Yeah, I, I had to laugh. I'm like, wow, that that's that's something else. And then so so they were saying, well, you have to go to Cologne Main Station to get it fixed. And I line up with the customer service, and they're like, well, what are you doing here? Because this isn't Cologne Deutsch. I'm like, well, the announcement told me to come here, so. So the guy rolled his eyes and gave me a new itinerary, caught the train to um, Frankfurt Airport, changed there, and then get in another train to go to central Germany and Kassel. And then all of a sudden they come on, they're like, yeah, there's a technical issue with this train. So we're going to be 20 minutes delayed oh, leaving Frankfurt man. Airport Station. It's just plagued. Okay. Then was in central Germany for a couple of days, then took a train to Vienna via Nuremberg. And... The train that I was on originally was delayed and I'm freaking out that, you know, it's not going to, I'm going to miss my connection in Nuremberg, but eventually it made up time and uh, we were all good. Uh, And then we leave Nuremberg and halfway between Nuremberg and Regensburg, the train just stops at this town in the middle of nowhere. And they open the door and people even get out and have a smoke. (laughs) And then they're like, okay. Station? Yeah, it was like some sort oh. of little regional station somewhere. I have no idea what was going on. Okay. Um, and then they're like, okay, well, okay, now it's time to go. And then I ended up in, in Vienna eventually. But yeah, just weird that the the high-speed train just sort of ran on its own schedule. Huh. Bit of time in Vienna, then took Austrian from Vienna to uh, Frankfurt. Uneventful check-in, straightforward service. Had some people beside me who were all seeming to be traveling as a group and drinking beer. And somehow, I don't know that the, the flight crew, they still had bottles of beer with them as we landed. I'm like, I thought that would have been picked up by the flight crew before. What did it appear to be aircraft beer? Yeah, I think it was. Wow. And they let them land. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I was like, I don't know what's going on. I don't care. And then what kind of, uh, what kind of aircraft was this? A 320 again? 320. Yeah. Standard. Yeah. And then get to Frankfurt. I mean, I had to pick the bag, recheck it, and then learned that at Frankfurt Airport, you've got a set of terminals that are going to let you check in, but they won't print your baggage tag. You have to go specifically to the baggage check-in to get the thing to print your baggage and then attach it to your bag, as opposed to Toronto or Canadian airports where it's like, you'll get the thing spit out for you when you're there. Yeah. And so, then did you have to queue to drop the bag? Yeah. And and I lost some, I mean, I was like, okay, looking around, trying to figure things out and then felt like an idiot. Well, I'm like, oh, it's, it's that forward, straightforward. You know, the one thing I always remember about Frankfurt, uh, specifically with Lufthansa, because obviously it's Lufthansa's hub or one of their hubs. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of Lufthansa desks. There's a different, you know, and it's kind of like a, what do you call it? different angles of counters. Mm-hmm. And it, it's funny, I've always approached them like, oh, wow, that's a big line. That's going to suck. And you go around a corner and there's the exact same you know, processing section. I'm like, well, I'll just go here then. And it's totally fine. It's one of those weird setups they have where they just... Well, and they... for me, it was like, there was only like one line for like, uh, because I had paid for a business class upgrade on this particular flight. Uh, there was one line and I thought, well, I'll stand here. And then I'm like, well, wait do I really need to? Cause all these people are taking forever. Cause it appeared to be more ticketing than mm. uh, others. So that I was like, all right, well let's, let's go over to this, this baggage thing and see if that'll actually fix the problem. And went back and asked somebody and they're like, yeah, yeah, just go over there. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So got through Frankfurt up into the Z gates or the Z gates. Yeah. And confused the border person because she's like, wait a sec, you left you're in London, but you've got a French stamp. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was on Eurostar. They stamped me before I leave England. Uh, That's right. And cleared that that time of the night because it was a late 10 o'clock flight to Johannesburg. 
the uh, Lufthansa lounge in the Z section was pretty empty. Nice. So it was uh, you know easy food. You know, pretty much could sit almost anywhere I wanted. And then I yeah, got um, onto the 747-800 and uh, up the stairs to business class. So pause there before you take off out of there. While you were doing that, I was meeting and you had also met, we forgot to mention just for the London portion, with our good friend, Paul Papadimitriou. Exactly. In, yeah. in London. So that was excellent. So shout out, Paul. Fantastic catching up from both of us. Exactly. Yeah. Crazy, chatting. crazy stories. They're lots of fun. Yeah. Uh, and just, you know, all things aviation and travel and podcast. Uh, it was a good time. So looking forward. And, and to IT and tech and other things like that as well. It was was uh, as fun as I thought it would be to talk to him in person as as it was when we spoke to him virtually. Yeah, exactly. So looking forward to when we can uh, either catch another beverage somewhere in the world or who knows, maybe we'll get another recording in somewhere. And uh, Paul made a comment on his podcast that you know, he's gotten a lot of um, uh, comments from people that he's ever visited Canada. So Paul, you know, like, feel free to come on by. We'll give you a good time. Yeah, you're due. You're due, my friend. <laughs> you bet. So now departing out of Paul's favorite airport, Frankfurt. <laughs> yes, yes. And he's like, uh, look, I'm, you know, he's just about two meters tall or six foot four or five or whatever he is. And he's like, look, I've got a connection between two different parts of airport, you know, maybe up to the Z terminal. He's like, I do it. I'm running. I don't know how like, you know, some little grandmother or somebody does it. You know, I've in like in 40 years. Minutes. Yeah. Flying through Frankfurt. Like I've knock on wood. I've never had a miss or anything go awfully wrong in Frankfurt. But yes, it is long and complicated. And I've always, again, those of us that are of the aviation mindset, we know how to navigate that thing. I mean, you just follow the signs, follow the signs, follow the signs. But for the layperson, a lot of the signs look the same. Yeah, It is very, very easy to just take one wrong turn somewhere. Exactly. The complete other end. Security in Frankfurt, I mean, they're very stereotypically German bureaucratic more than yep. other countries would be. So, so yeah, cleared, cleared customs, got on the plane. So this is the 747-800. Excellent. Exactly. Love it. Exactly. Uh, upper yeah. deck. Upper deck window. Yeah. With the, uh, the cubby holes or the right beside my seat to, uh, yeah. to put my bags in. Now the seat, it looked like, it didn't look like the newest, newest product that they were running. Up. No, um, it's uh I think a previous iteration, but it did the full recline. Like lie flat. Yeah. Yeah. But you had someone next to you that you had to hop over. Yeah. But I tried to time it as best I could. I mean, it was, it was difficult. It would be the same as in some flights. If you on a later flight, I mean, if you were sitting in the window banks, like on the sides, uh, you would have to climb over the person. So yeah, it wasn't the most recent uh, variation. Some things involved, but oh, well, I'm in a 747 upstairs you know, enjoying the champagne and the, the multi-course and yeah, you know, the, the pajamas and the, uh, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. No, the, the business class product is, it's not necessarily the most extravagant and flash out there when you stack it up against your Emirates and your, uh, Qatar and Turkish, all these guys, Singapore, but it's solid and reliable. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, we had a fair amount of turbulence. The whole way. I mean, it shook me awake. Oh wow! That's, but uh, uh, but yeah. I mean, it was it, for the for the price I paid. The it was very economical uh, for that length of flight. And so, if you do have an opportunity to upgrade to something where you can fly flat, obviously, do it. Do it. Yeah. Landed at Johannesburg, busy airport. Um, they were doing temperature checks when we got off um, to make sure everybody was okay. Proceeded. Customs was pretty straightforward. And uh, yeah, I picked up the bag, met some friends. We uh, sat in a restaurant, waited for more friends, and had a good time. That's and great. then, yeah, road trips. Johannesburg's, um, you know, the, the times that I've flown in there, it's never been problematic from what I recall. It's just kind of just, I, that being said, I mean, Joburg's not a major, major high volume hub either. I mean, but when, they when get big planes, when the planes land, they all seem to be, you know, they, they land at the same time and, and it's true. It is pretty busy. Yeah. Like they have these huge spikes. Yeah. But it just seems to work. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then, you know, the insanity of, uh, you know, just getting around Johannesburg with all, felt a bit like LA with all yeah. the freeways and everything. So Johannesburg, then you went off for an adventure to Mozambique. Yeah. So road trip down to Kruger, then up into Maputo, um, spent time there, checked in uh, a really early flight, 6 a.m. to Nampula, which is two and a half hour flight north of uh, Maputo with LAM from Mozambique. Decent airline, national flight, straightforward. What kind of aircraft was that? 737. Oh, okay. 700, I think. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, straightforward. I fell asleep on that flight. So any breakfast service I slept through. And then we took um, minibuses out to the Isla de Mozambique, which was another two and a half hour drive. Incredible times on that particular island of historical significance. And then uh, adventure coming back. Uh, we were a bit late leaving on a Sunday morning. Our flight was at noon. And uh, you know, two Sorry, and a half. Sun, noon out of? Out of Nampula. Okay. So we left uh, Elon Mozambique at like 7.30. We were doing well. Not quite sure if the driver had a legitimate license or not. And then we get well, yeah, that pulled part over <laughs> twice in the span of like 10 minutes uh, for like a 20 minute wait each with the police checking our passports each time. They knowing that we are pressed for time. Eventually the driver asked to provide a bit of extra compensation to the people pulling us over. So we got moving. <laughs> right. As uh, things I mean, go. Exactly. And we race through Nampula, uh, you know, guys on the horn the whole time. Gate closed at 11.25. We arrive at 11.28. They reopen the gate. Sorry, check-in closed at that time yeah. or the gate? No, check-in closed at 11.25. So you come off the curb at 11.28. Well, we come off the curb at like 11.25. We're at the desk at like 11.28. Oy. Okay. And they reopen the gate for us. Let us check our bags in. Oh, that's okay. And um, and then they, they look at me. They're like, wait, your bag's too heavy. I was like a kilo and a bit over. And then I open up my one bag. I take out a laptop like, oh, it's okay. I'm like, okay, whatever. But then being that we got in so late, I was last row middle, but it had a hot meal on a domestic flight. Shrimp or beef were the choices. Um, straightforward, landed, no issue. I mean, Nampula Airport, tiny uh, uh, boarding area with like a tiny little belt and whatever. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it works. Then flight. Maputo for a couple of days. Flight from Maputo to Johannesburg with Airlink. Yeah. Uh, with an Air Embraer 75, I think, at the top of my uh, head. Yeah, that sounds about right. The one and two. And uh, then we get to Johannesburg, and I was connecting to Cape Town. And so then they wouldn't put the bags through. So we had to pull the bags off the belt, run them through the terminal up to the domestic check in, drop the bags off again. And then proceed through customs. Oh, because you're coming through, through security. Page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was a would have been nice to just have a drop belt to put the bag on mm-hmm. after clearing customs, but that doesn't exist at Joburg right now. And then an Ember 90, I think it was, from um, Joburg to Cape Town, Cape Town Airport, straightforward, very nice, easy to get to from around the mountain from downtown. Then few days in Cape Town and seeing everything around there. Then from Cape Town to Frankfurt on a Airbus 340-300. Yes, I saw the picture you sent. That's, yeah. uh, <laughs> wow, Lufthansa still got those going. Well, take it out of storage in Spain. I'm sure it uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. makes it fly. <laughs> yeah. Prima economy on that flight, uh, window seat, bulkhead, leg rest, slept all right uh, for three, four hours on a 11, a 12 hour flight. And I uh, got into Frankfurt. I had a schedule like five ish in the morning. Didn't realize right away that I needed to go through customs to get back to my gate that I, sorry, not customs, uh, security to, uh, to check through again, but then realized that a bunch of people who didn't necessarily remember how to fly with like li- liquids and everything else. Oh no. So amateur keep, hour. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And then back to Toronto. What was I on? I was on a seven, yeah, triple seven, three hundred, triple seven, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, straightforward bulkhead, um, premium economy seat. Nice. Yeah. So 
and then landed in Toronto just a little bit late, uh, about 20 minutes because we were a little bit late pushing out of Frankfurt. But how was the Toronto arrival baggage? Any issues? Because Toronto's been under the hot fire for the last couple. It was it was great. I mean, I had uh, Nexus and was literally through customs in three minutes. I mean, I had already filled out the arrive can, had everything. Mm-hmm. They cross matched my Nexus against uh, physically, uh, so that takes a bit of time. Obviously, when there's more people, and then yeah, bags were fairly quick coming off. Probably about ten minutes. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, yeah maybe things are getting sorted out. If you're liking this episode experience. You may also enjoy Experience 20, Go or No Go, when Vinny and Jeff's rail travel plans went sideways. It's available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Wow, How was so your return from Vancouver to Vancouver? Yeah, so Terminal 2 departure, same thing. This is the same flight back. In fact, it was the same aircraft doing the turn that we came in on. Flight was at... 15.50, so 3.50 p.m. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, when you check in on the Air Canada website, it says to get to Heathrow four hours prior, okay. uh, which is a little bit aggressive. I was like, well, again, is is our arrival going to reflect how our departure is going to be? Who knows? Again, fearing the chaos. So I thought four hours a bit much. I said, well, we'll leave where we're staying four hours out just under, about an hour away. So we'll get there at the standard three hours. So got in, check-in. The, the Terminal 2 check-in area is always a little bit tight. I think just the physical geography of it from all the years I remember going there. And with the redo of the terminal, it's nothing's changed too much. But it's kind of weird that the Air Canada section's sort of on the, the first column A. And they've split it into bag drop, check-in assistance, and then any premium passengers, you know, status holders or premium classes are around a corner on this other section. Well, we were traveling with a young toddler, so I'm trying to find some sort of family check-in. Couldn't find it. So anyway, got to just use the regular bag drop. Funnily enough, the, the agent was being a little bit too finicky about weights and things. So I had a few words with him. But anyway, we got it. We are all through. And I thought, okay, well, security. So we go and at security, again, there's a, there's a family aisle and then there's like the main one. So what they do is they bulk everybody up and then they send everyone through in waves. Hmm. So that's the method they're using versus like this is continual drill. So it seems a bit much at first. You're like, oh my goodness, this queue's big. But once inside is getting close to empty, then they sort of release Fill everybody. It up again fill it and you sort of go in these long long runs the family queue we're not exactly sure why it was a family queue there was no different like you know the the main ones had the scan your boarding pass to get through Mm -hmm. but i guess i mean people have different scenarios so but what was funny is that we went through and again this is just so classic of staff not paying attention or you know training issues as a family queue they're you go through and there's sort of like this wall and the bulk of people are all going to the right. Well, to the left, there's also an opening which takes you into the hall. The person that was supposed to be staffing this sort of left turn, he was chatting with a friend. So everyone, we were all just kind of going to the right. I kind of saw it out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, wait a minute, were we supposed to go through that? There's a stanchion there being controlled by a human. And sure enough, you loop the corner and you see that that is a direct shortcuts all the other lines. I'm like, well, that's the whole point of family or, you know, people with disabilities. So I just told my wife, I was like, "Uh, we're supposed to be on the other side of that stanchion. We're jumping the stanchion. So we literally Hmm. just like pushed underneath and went through. Nobody seemed to care. And again, you know, me being of the know knew how this works. So many people were just getting jammed into the regular. I'm like, we're staff and training. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Anyway, get through. Go with security. What was weird is um, the guy made me put the stroller through the X-ray belt. Okay. But yet, there's a clearly there's a sign that says push chairs go through here. So it was all a bit confusing. But anyway, so they had wheelchair and push chair together and like this gate that could open. Okay. Like, 
why are you making me put the stroller through through the x-ray when it there's a spot for it here anyway we get through get through get through uh to be honest it it was just like a regular busy day at Heathrow. it wasn't anything extravagant it was just what it was normal things and i mean we were through from curb to inside in less than an hour Mm. and then you're just sort of in the retail hall you know everyone's staring at the screen wondering what what their gate's going to be but if you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I know that we are going to be at a B gate in this case because, you know, it's all the infos there on flight aware and all these things. So I was yeah. like, okay, I know where we're going. So same thing. We just kind of peeled off, did a bit of reset, baggage reset. Uh, there's some great food options there, by the way. Hmm. So we did that and then made our way. So the B gates is like a satellite uh, rectangle that you do okay. on underground passageway. Just nice, easy walk, moving walkways firm easy get to the other side air canada flight ram packed flight i think there was two open seats we took off uh we departed push back early by like four minutes taxi straight out take off and it was eight hours and 55 minutes direct to vancouver vancouver arrival straightforward however so we come off and I'm thinking, okay, what's going to happen here in Vancouver? They actually did have a family line for immigration, which was nice. Got through, no issues. Bags are on the belt, but here's the kicker. There were no carts. Ah! All the carts were gone, and they had not caught up with, mm. you know, the person goes, stacks them with the little motorized buggy thing and drives them in. Yeah. So everyone, and this was us, there were there was in two Asian flights and a bunch of US. Like it was every carousel was moving. So we hit yeah. it at a very busy time. So we're all scrambling, trying to find a cart, find a cart. So I kind of use my knowledge, having worked at this airport before. I'm like, I got to see where I can find a cart. Go around this corner behind this other woman. There's two carts in front of us, both running for it. I yeah. nab this cart. Anyway, as I'm pulling bags off the belt, then finally, the little motorized thing comes in as a man driving it with like mm. you know, 100 cars. I'm like, okay, well, fine. <laughs> so then something else is going to be, oh, right. Just before we left, actually, and also at the time when you left, Canada announced that they were reinstituting randomized COVID-19 testing mm-hmm. on arrival. So I thought, oh, brother, here we go. And I had been through this on my previous journeys to Japan, to China. So we went through the immigration, you know, no sticker was put on our passport, no indication of a test. And what's funny is when we exited the customs hall, there's, there is no randomized testing right now. Yeah. I didn't have there's any either. No was, infrastructure. Looking yeah. Forward, yeah. There's nothing. It was kind of wild. I'm like, where's the randomized testing? Oh, well, so much for that. See ya. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we were out. So yeah. all in all smooth, uh, nothing, nothing noteworthy of chaos in that sense of a word. Uh, I think we were very lucky. I mean, this, Plenty of friends and people that are traveling that are mm-hmm. having issues. Um, exactly. Uh, two other points that I had that I was thinking when you were going over your things. Interesting thing in Mozambique, and I'm sure it might just be a, an employment thing, but when you take your bag off the belt before you leave the de- like the arrival hall, there is somebody actually who's comparing your uh, sticker that you claim got check. for claim checking. They're con- matching your bag to make sure that it's your bag. You know, and they should do that in every airport, really. Yeah. Yeah, I've encountered that in a number of places around the world. Like in Asia, that's quite common as well. Yeah. It makes sense. And then the other thing is um, I had um, paid extra for Maple Leaf Lounge in Frankfurt. So the shower in the YUL room at the Air Canada Lounge was incredibly uh, nice and uh Refreshing after the 11 and uh, 12 hour flight from Cape Town. Yeah, absolutely. And we've talked about the the, the value of a shower before. Yeah. I, it's funny. I think I did that exact same thing. I flew Cape Town, Frankfurt, had like a five hour stop, and the shower made it all good to go on yet another. And, and I read, shower. and it makes sense that people say, like, look, if you're in Frankfurt, the Air Canada Lounge is probably a better option than, say, like a Lufthansa Senator Lounge because there are less people. Everybody's going to go to the Lufthansa Lounge. That's right. At, but like for all of these flights that are coming in early in the morning, the Air Canada one, it was about 60% busy. Yeah. But 
It's a nice. But I mean, it, it was uh, a very nice lounge. straightforward, and I mean, at, at seven, I mean, people aren't yet arriving who are coming from Germany to to take the flights. So you've got a bit of a gap where it's like, okay, there aren't many people right That's now. Right. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, we're both home. So exactly. And we've got more things we can dissect and uh, look at uh, in upcoming experiences. Absolutely. Uh, and just, you know, we didn't do too much news on this episode, but we just want to make note of the, uh, the famous Nancy Pelosi flight yes. uh, into Taipei. And uh, the most ever tracked flight on uh, flight radar 24's history. That's incredible. <laughs> A lot, a lot riding or was riding on that one. Exactly. I believe it's 737, actually. Now that I'm looking at it. Uh, trying to find, yeah, 708,000 people live watching. But I think two, just under 3 million tracked it all together. Thing. Yeah. Cause it was like a seven hour flight. Yeah. So that's incredible. So it was a Air Force, it was a C 40. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, 737 in a military name, right? Yeah, Fantastic. from uh, from Kuala Lumpur to Taipei. Yes. Yeah. Right on. Okay. All right. Well, that was good. I think uh, we both had a uh, good fill of travels. Good to be back. Good to see travel banging up again, as chaotic as it can be. But the skies are filling, and you know, all, all things considered, over the past two years, um, it's nice to see it coming back. Exactly. And Hopefully, I mean, I'm- safely still. I've got a couple more flights in the next uh, two months. Uh, North America, one at the end of this month, uh, visiting some family in Saskatchewan. So rather than connecting through Calgary and taking chances, I'm taking a direct flight. <laughs> smart. Very smart. <laughs> and then a, uh, a points flight to Philadelphia for uh, for one of our former interviews, Danny, meeting up with him in, in Philadelphia. So, Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Perfect. I have a couple of friends that have just done some flights, some chaos. So maybe in the next episode, we can dissect theirs as well. Uh, a friend went to Phoenix uh, from Vancouver and it took 18 hours to get there. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about that and more and more to come. So excellent. Yeah. So that uh, wraps up experience 64 of the Seat Money podcast. If you liked this podcast experience, be sure to rate us and subscribe. Tell your friends and fellow travelers about us. Make sure you visit us at podcast.seat1a.org for complete show notes. That's Sierra Echo Alpha Tango, the number one, alpha.org. Feedback, addenda, letting us know where you've messed up. You can send all of that to stories, S-T-O-R-I-E-S, at seat1a.org. If you'd like to support the show financially, we have a page at Patreon, patreon.com forward slash seat 1a links are included in the show notes and here's what you look forward to in upcoming podcast experiences more interviews and more dissecting of people's travel chaos and please if you are traveling and have things going on please let us know we always look forward to your stories or if there's anything you want to share with us uh, or to discuss please let us know we still have airport wayfinding and traveling with uh, senior citizens on the list so lots more to come Excellent. So until the next time, I'm Jeff. Thanks for listening. And I'm Vinod. You're cleared for takeoff. Have a great flight.